What is color chord? Well, as my GitHub page here says, it is a chromatic sound to light conversion system. But what exactly does that mean? And where did this whole project come from? Well, to begin with, I never really even intended to develop any kind of sound to light conversion system at all. In fact, all I really wanted to do was add some LEDs to this clear guitar here and uh, go with it. And, uh, well, the guitar looked awesome with the LEDs, but if all it does is just light up, that's really not that cool. So I figured somebody else surely had figured out how to actually make LEDs go to light and music and all that that was good. But the answer was no. Everybody was just using color organs and really just kind of very old techniques to try to map color to sound. So I developed Color Chord 1. And uh, you can actually see here, it's running on my laptop. <clears throat> this is a very old video. It's uh, from, what, uh, 2010. Uh, so this was of Color Chord 1. And uh, Color Chord 1 was my attempt at uh, creating a sound to light mapping system specifically for this guitar. Um, and it, it worked pretty well. And I ended up having to develop several techniques, including systems like a folded Fourier system and all of that, which I'll get into soon. And, uh, and you'll see it. But this all started with something that had to run on a GPU of a laptop because it was just such a computationally expensive system. I realized it had other potential, so I started applying it to light shows. Uh, Dr. Rocker by Mayhem uh, was one of my inspiring uh, songs that really kind of got me to really focus on it. <clears throat> and, um, and from there, uh, it just was something that was impractical. It would need to be run on the GPU, it had enormous amounts of computational needs, and it just the latency wasn't there and, and everything else. But I let my friend Will take a crack at it. And it was able to go from something that required a GPU on a laptop all the way down to, uh, as I discuss in my, um, my article here, my IEEE article, uh, it'll work all the way down to a little 80 megahertz ESP8266. And so that's what we can see in this video of my friend David playing his saxophone. <clears throat> the entire system for doing the sound to light conversion is operating on an ESP8266 sitting inside of his saxophone, right there on the side. And it's even serving up this web page showing exactly what's going on. And uh, Color Core 2 isn't just limited to embedded devices. Color Core 2 is also a desktop application. So, for instance, uh, my uh, roommate Inverse Phase, he actually has panels of LEDs on his laptop that he uses during his shows. And um, and he uses it as a, uh, a light show. So the path from Color Chord 1 to Color Chord 2 was a long one, but it started even before that. So just for some video here, let's, let's get Color Chord 2 fired up. Dragging the window up, over. Okay, so here's Color Chord 2. And uh, Color Chord 2 here has different effects I can run. Right now it's running a Voronoi diagram in the background. So if I go E you can see that the background primary color is being selected and if there's additional colors it will display them. That's actually the same thing that's being used with Brendan's visuals here. Of course, color cord isn't limited just to this sort of display. It can be limited. It can also display any number of other form factors, such as a uh, linear bar uh, across the uh, oops across a uh, say this in my living room. So right here, you can see that color cord can be mapped directly to a bar. Um, so all in all, that, that's pretty useful, but let's go into a little bit more about how color chord works. So it first starts with the sine wave of the input. So this little wave going across here, this, this one right here in the, uh, the top area, this, this right here is just a sine wave coming in from the mic. So if I go, you can see the sine wave of exactly what's coming off of my voice. 
It then performs a discrete Fourier transform on that sound, not a fast Fourier transform, because there are other properties that we want to maintain that we can do much more easily by using a fast Fourier transform into its frequency components, starting at around 55 hertz and then going up by octave. Now you'll notice that many times there's overtones, and those overtones are actually one octave up, and sometimes there's overtones that aren't quite an octave up or an octave and apart. But you'll find that in general, notes will play on each other. So what I've chosen was if I have yellow here, then it's going to be yellow here too. And now there's this blue overtone right here. But it's mostly yellow with some blue. So it maps the, the colors by note, not by frequency in, uh, in general. So it's not that a low sound is a blue sound or a high sound is a yellow sound because ooh, yellow, yellow, yellow. Each octave that the yellow appears in, it's just the same note within the octave. <clears throat> That way, you get similar themes. So you can have a bass instrument playing a E, and a guitar playing an E, and I don't know, I don't some other instrument, maybe a person singing an E. Oh boy, that's way too high for me. And it maps to the same colors. And so that's just uh, a little bit of a taste for how that works. Now, once it does this complete Fourier decomposition, which you can see across the top of the screen, it then has to fold that onto itself. So it doesn't care what octave a sound comes in, it just cares what notes are being played. So if we look right here in the middle of the screen, e lots of yellow, Ooh, yellow, yellow. Notice how whichever octave that I was speaking in, it would still just kind of go along the screen and back. Now that's great for finding where all of the notes are, um, <clears throat> but there there's a lot more that needs to be done. Uh, so let's go back here. Uh, in order to actually decompose this into notes, I have an algorithm that searches through this and iteratively tries to find the peaks of where the sound is. So ye, there's one right here. And that contributes to the largest peak. So this peak here and this single O is mapped to that peak there. Hold on, let's, uh, let's turn off the Voronoi diagram to see this a little more clearly. Okay, oh, whoop, nope, gotta restart. Let's try that again. Do, okay, that's much better, much less busy. So down here, you, there's a yellow and a blue. And so when we see yellow and blue right here and here, we now know that there's a certain amount of yellow and a certain amount of blue, and that those are two major harmonics in what the sound is being output. That way it can decide that, oh, I need to actually go put you know, this amount of yellow or this amount of blue on the screen or on the output device, whatever it is. Uh, and so that's the general principle between how Color Chord 2 operates. Now the internals of how Color Chord 2 operates is a lot more sophisticated. Because Color Chord 1 itself also did the whole uh, discrete Fourier transform, like what we see up top there, but it took significantly longer to perform. Now that's lost a little bit in the algorithm that my friend Will had figured out, but uh, he was able to determine different tricks to play with the sound to make it take orders of magnitude less computation time. So here's an example of something that would be impractical to do, certainly on an ESP8266, that is trivial to do with the, the right kind of uh, algorithm. So this is Color Core 2 operating on a PC. But Color Core 2 isn't just limited to PCs, it can be used on any number of small devices that could be used for light shows right at the devices themselves. 
Um, this is probably a good stopping point for this video, though, uh, because, well, I think all of the others will go a little bit more into depth in different aspects. So thanks for watching, and keep your eyes peeled for more Color Chord 2 videos.